Well, my story starts uh, with a French exchange. I was destined to fail French O-level. Um, at that point in time, it was critical to get French uh, so that you could get into university. And my parents were uh, determined that I should pass. Uh, the route map for that was to send me on a French exchange. I arrived in Lyon at age 15 and was picked up by Pierre, that was his name, um, and his father, and driven to their home in Macon. And within the first day, my first cultural experience was to be taken to a field just outside Macon, where a new station had been built where the TGV, the new French high-speed rail line, had just been newly constructed. Pierre's father had an extraordinary interest uh, in this train line, slightly bemusing, and encouraged me to listen to the line. The line sang when the train approached. A couti la train, he said to me somewhat excitedly, and you can probably tell that I only just passed French O-level. <laughs> What was extraordinary about that and in reflecting upon that was that Pierre's father had an extraordinary pride in what had just arrived on his doorstep. It had put his town on the map, but it had also um, given him a great sense of pride. He was part of something national as well as local. If I was to ask you the question, and it may well indeed affect you as it's affected me, if somebody was to tell you that a new rail line was going to arrive within 500 metres of your town or village, one, would you be happy? Two, would you take a guest within 24 hours of arriving at your home to stand at the station and wonder how marvellous it was? I fancy the answer is probably no. However, the question is why do we feel like that? I think culturally we are fearful of change. And change leads to a number of fears. And more often than that, that can be related to a fear of the unknown and a fear of lack of information. So the position that the UK now faces is that there are many projects coming forward. We are now at a period of time in our history, perhaps the first time since the Victorian era, era and certainly probably um, since uh, Cold War, uh, since uh, uh, War, uh, post-war reconstruction, where there is massive change in development and in infrastructure planning. So a lot of development of this type is emerging and becoming part of our society and culture. I honestly believe that part of the issue connected with people's fear is the way that these projects are communicated and the lack of story or narrative um, behind the reasons why. I think also people fear um, these projects because of the lack of engagement with them and the lack of understanding of them. And I certainly don't think there is much pride welling up in people's hearts when they think about these projects. And I think that's a shame. Some people say that we get the history we deserve. I think the position probably is more that the future generations will get the history that we determine right now. And we have a responsibility as members of society within government and as consultants of my type to make sure that legacy and that inheritance is a good one. These projects last uh, certainly much longer than a political cycle of five years. They tend to last in the hundreds of years. And as a result, this, I think, should change the way we think about things and the value we place on them. More often than not, these projects are really scrutinised under one single theme, which relates to economic efficiency, um, operational efficiency. But as a society, is that enough? And if we were to project 500 years ahead and ask those generations to look back, is that really going to be enough to mark us uh, in this period of history as being sufficient? Infrastructure has many different scales. I think probably for most of us, when we talk about it, it's the mega project, the large national project that somehow spans a number of regions, um, is centralized through government. But infrastructure also um, deals with a small scale. And the light in the everyday is a really important part of making these projects 
um, a contribution to life rather than a disbenefit to life. Going back to my own childhood, the village I grew up in, in Surrey, started as a small rural community with a very strong um, estate uh, behind it. But with the coming of the rail line, this little dot on the map uh, grew to become possibly what I would call um, some form of um, Arcadian uh, delight, um, certainly a lovely place to grow up, um, facilitated by this wonderful rail line that extended up to Waterloo. It also had a wonderful waiting station, uh, a, a waiting room, uh, where my now wife and I spent many happy hours uh, waiting to catch the train to school. It even had an open fire that was stoked by the Polish lady who worked at the station. Every morning in the winter, it was there, ready. So these elements of delight, the importance of the granularity of the approach we take in design is a very important part of making these projects significant and material to the quality of our life. I want to run through three examples which are perhaps contrasting. We certainly can learn from history. Um, we can learn history, but we can also learn from history. The first um, project I want to uh, talk about very briefly is a project that Joseph Basil Jett um, undertook at the embankment. This project really demonstrates the issues connected with making investment work hard. For a little bit more spent, you get an awful lot more for your money. Basil Jett's brief was to solve the cholera problem for London. There was an operational imperative. But rather than just find a route for the pipe, he established the embankment. The embankment is something for those who live in London that we probably hold dear as a fantastic piece of civic public realm. It didn't only just find a route for the foul route um, for sewage from London. Uh, when Basil Jett designed it, he also designed it to take uh, the underground, uh, train routes into London. He doubled the size of the pipes because he had a forecast that London was going to grow. So at one and the same time, he both answered the operational need, but at the same time created three other possible benefits in addition. The way we think about infrastructure right now tends to be single-minded, every project for itself. There is a singularity of intent and the way the economics is um, constructed around these projects, the opportunity for collaboration and for the creation of mutual benefit um, is very, very difficult to secure. In complete contrast to the embankment, uh, and bringing us slightly more up to date, this is Old Oak. Old Oak is planned as London's next major new development area. It will be taller, denser, and bigger than Canary Wharf. Why do I raise this? I raise this because this area of London is probably one of the most uh, challenged in terms of uh, the history of infrastructure planning. David did say I would be able to reach the screen, but I can't. <laughs> but what I will tell you and, and just guide you, um, hopefully you can see um, here the um, wiggly line running through, which is the Grand Union Canal, and a series of railway lines that crisscross um, the scene here. This large area coming in here is the Crossrail um, construction terminal and very soon HS2 as it thunders down from Birmingham will come in with a new station here. To reach here and reach North Acton um, the challenge is massive. That area will have to be decked over to cross over the Crossrail depot and there will be a series of islands connected by bridges um, as a result of the nature of the engineering and the history that's been inherited at Old Oak. The change that um, North Acton has gone through historically is ultimately the separation of what is commonly known as the Scrubs Common to the south, this extraordinary open space and natural habitat, and Acton to the north. This isn't really something we want to repeat, and it does require collaboration and forward thinking to um, avoid uh, future challenges such as this. Bringing us right up to date, I now take you to Wales. This project is the Swansea Tidal Lagoon that David mentioned uh, very briefly. This project, uh, from my perspective, has a very clear narrative, it has a very clear vision, and it's going to do a lot more than merely generate electricity by letting the water flood through massive turbines as the tide goes out and comes in. Yes, it does that, 
but it does several other things as well. It will protect Swansea from tidal surges. It allows for um, free movement of traffic in the uh, city, prompting further regeneration. It provides um, increased natural resource in terms of beaches and saltwater marshes. And the word mitigation doesn't really apply here. The project has been developed as one single answer, working through a series of collaborative endeavors uh, to answer a series of problems. So this project in many ways um, strikes the balance, in my view, of um, bringing forward operationally efficient infrastructure, but at one and the same time connecting with local people. This project probably from my perspective is characterized by something I would like to call enlightened self-interest. The concept that by doing good to others, you will also benefit. If infrastructure projects, if, uh, as they move forward, can be more self-enlightened and take this approach, then I think we'll be in a much better place. So what do we learn from this project? This project um, takes us to a point where I believe there is a positive legacy to be left. The client in this particular instance is entirely driven by creating positive legacy. But the position that this project now sits in is that at the moment government is uh, not willing to sanction the movement of this project moving forward. It has planning permission. It's been through an independent review by Charles Hendry, uh, appointed by the government. Uh, but at the moment the government can't see or doesn't seem to have the mechanics to be able to make a judgment on a project that not only produces electricity, the single-minded object, but actually a project that starts to deliver more than that. So we have a problem with the way that these projects are um, examined. What we seem to be unable to do is place value on place, community and amenity. And these are very important values that need to be added to the simplicity of economics. And going back to my earlier point, as a generation in, in the future looks back, um, should all our projects be merely operationally and economically efficient, surely there must be something else. So I leave you with one final thought, as a number of uh, the guests have today, and it's clearly part of the tutoring we have had. <laughs> my question is, we all will leave a mark in history somewhere, like it or not. That can be as globally as on society, a culture, at a mega scale, but it might be right down to the small scale, to a family, to a community, to an individual child. And my question is for all of us is, what is our individual legacy? And how do we um, leave that legacy in a, in a positive place now? and uh, feel that we've been able to contribute to either society or, or family. So I leave it there, and I have 33 seconds left, and I think we're done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.